Welcome to The Emergent Human. We explore optimizing health and body spirituality and post-conventional living. I'm Michael Osterlink, a therapist, coach, and educator, and I'm your host. Today's show is brought to you by Cosper Scafidi, an amazing body worker in the Northern Virginia area, who's integrated different somatic practices into his work, into his work including rolfing. You can learn more about Cosper at his website, cosperscafidi.com. Today's guest is Melanie Slivka. Her passion and mission is to guide humanity to better health and happiness and reduce suffering. She believes that can be accomplished through physical and mental training and trials. Supportive fueling, recovery, self-care are the heart of these efforts. Through the actions of Unbeatable Mind Training and Seal Fit, she has been witness to thousands of people doing just this, living better lives, living lives of service, passion, and health, aligned with each person's unique offering. She started her journey as CEO of the first CrossFit equipment company, the Garage Gym Store. So for the past 12 years, she has trained and worked with many Navy SEAL team guys, thought leaders, and top performing executives. This experience has given her the unique mental and physical mentorship to help her assist others in this unique journey of an uncommon life. She's also owner and CEO of Kids Food Fight. She's a functional medicine practitioner, author of Six Weeks to Cleaner Eating, Certified on Beatable Mind Coach, Kokoro Yoga Certified Trainer, and a graduate of Kokoro 29, which I was fortunate to have the opportunity to be a, a, a coach for her camp there. <laughs> Mel, great to see you. Oh my gosh, you didn't have to read the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of cool Thank stuff you, you're into. Oh, yeah, of course. Well, I'm lucky well, to get to live this life. Well, as I was saying, uh, we're talking offline, you know, it's, it's great to reconnect with you and, and get caught up on all the cool things you're doing. You had mentioned that you had actually been a guest of mine, but this is like a million years ago. So we have a lot of catching up to do. Um, before we kind of get into some of the things you're doing now, including the work with kids, tell us a little about like the journey that led you to become the person you are today in terms of your professional life. Yeah, so when I, you know, when I think of who I turn to as my trusted mentors in life, it's it's a long journey. You know, I look at Mark, I look at yourself. Who are the folks that, you know, we turn to for that expanded knowledge set that we need in, in certain avenues? So I, I sort of jumped in the, the nutrition game uh, by necessity through SealFit. They didn't have anybody. We had been doing challenges, uh, nutritional challenges that didn't work with our membership. People were failing. And I thought, you know what, I think I can do a better job. Um, and I know these people. So that that camaraderie helped me to mold a program, which was um, and is still six weeks to cleaner eating. And from doing that in a CrossFit membership, I segued into having the ability to do challenges all over the world through SealFit Online. Yeah. And that's really the heart of how that all happened to me. Uh, these challenges were roughly based on the whole 30. So I'm going to give them some props because, yep. you know, that was a pretty incredible challenge. There's still around two that people do. Um, in my opinion, it was a bit too difficult for folks to just eliminate mm -hmm. everything on day one. So I wanted to do a little bit gentler approach. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. I built an elimination diet. The incredible part about that is when I went to functional medicine school, finally, when I went and got my master's degree, uh, after doing this work for five years without a master's degree, just uh, having great mentors like Ben Greenfield and Rob Wolf and Gabriel, Rob Wolf, yeah. right? Yep. Dr. The Lawrence, best, yeah. Right. I was so fortunate to have these in this incredible staff of trusted mentors yeah. uh, in the field. They drove me to complete my master's and start to do my own work as well, work with them. And uh, so this program of the six weeks to cleaner eating segued into a larger program that included the mental fortitude, the unbeatable program, as well as seal fit and the physical training. Hmm. So then we've been doing that for eight, some years, um, all the while it became really clear to me that my calling and Michael, this was really like, you know, um, from my higher source, from my higher power that I got this message. I literally woke up in the middle of the night, I think in July, five years ago, and it said, you need to do this for kids. Like these kids are really sick. And um, the folks are struggling with nutrition and diet and processed food. If they're struggling, the kids are struggling. Oh, yeah. Right. And so uh, I just, I was like, okay, okay. Um, I'm listening. I'm going to write a book. 
because I've written a book before. And so I started to write a book and it became really clear that, that there was a huge obstacle there and it was my knowledge set, right? Mm-hmm. It was uh, the physiological process of nutrition. And so then <laughs> I said, I'm gonna go get my master's. And I talked to some of my friends who had done master's programs and uh, found a few different schools. And that was fantastic. I applied. Now you have to remember, I hadn't been in school in 20 years at that point. For a while. So, and I went to school for theater. (laughs) (laughs) Communications. So all of that undergrad stuff, you know, I had to take this test called the MAT test. This was the biggest obstacle in my way, my Mm -hmm. bone. I swear to God, I believe in God because of this test. It's hilarious. Um, The test is a undergrad, uh, a massive like... um, sort of a general knowledge undergrad test. So they want to know a little bit about everything you studied in your undergrad. Astronomy, philosophy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And so they, I had like took a sample test and I took a little sample course. When I went and sat down to take that test in August of, I think three years ago, I literally knew maybe five answers on 150 question tests, like for sure. And I just did my best. I just filled in everything I could. And then they corrected there on the spot. The girl came in and she's like, are you ready to press the button? And I'm like, I'd already been accepted to the school. I just needed to have this test. Oh, wow. Right. I was already ready to go. So with this test, everything was writing on this test for the University of the Western State. She pressed the button and it said that I passed. And I was like, oh my God. So okay, um, cool. once again, this has been led to me. I've been, I've been called to do this work and I feel really privileged to be able to be, um, conduit for kids nutrition yeah. so after that I finished my master's studies and I uh, thought about writing the book but then I went back to how I created the six weeks to cleaner eating and what I did with that is I took that through challenges with my community and we figured out what was right we honed in on the on the craft we honed in on the on the uh, success what was more successful what wasn't and so that's my approach here with the kids food fight However, it became a lot bigger, a lot quicker than, you know, the kid, the six weeks to cleaner eating. And I got a partner and I I got a staff and now I have, you know, marketing and people actually really behind this cause to help kids. So here we are and the book will come later, but now we're just in the process of helping kids and their families change, change their lives. Which I love that. And I love for you to unpack that, but let me ask you a question because you know, I mentioned offline the last time I saw you, you were still in school. It's a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, right? Actually, probably right before COVID kind of kicked in and killed everything. Yep. Um, and I'm curious, like, you know, what did you learn in school during your master's program that w- was eye-opening for you that either changed your course of understanding and, and focus or just kind of opened you up to a, a broader view or, mm. or, or were you already like, oh, I know all these things. I just need to deepen my understanding of any particular thing. Uh, no, I knew very little. I knew very okay. little physiologically about the body and how it processes. I knew a bit of cellular, you know, cellular function. You know, I knew the basics. I know, I know the muscles, of course, because I'm a trainer. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. Right. So I know physiology and how the body moves, but you know, this is way, way different. And to do functional medicine, that was <laughs> it was actually um, combined with the nutrition. I have a, a master's in nutrition and functional medicine. So that was uh, incredible. And I wasn't sure I'd go with that, Michael, because I'm fascinated by the gut and biome. And so that area uh, is not my expertise, but eventually I know that I'll fulfill, you know, uh, that calling as well. And I think that's really important as well. And I think that that happens in childhood. So many reasons, so many things affect your biome very early on. So, and then, you know, oh my gosh, mitochondrial health, right? Um, every single your brain health everything was just a turn on like you know you're doing you're studying the right thing when every single thing you study is just fascinating and mind-blowing yeah, to yeah, you exactly yeah, yeah. yeah so I knew I was in the right spot or um I knew I was in the spot to to move forward from and I wasn't sure where that would be once I got into it yeah it's just interesting with your you mentioned the microbiome how our culture pretty much said everything opposite of what the microbiome actually needs to fully function to operationalize the rest of the human system. It's like, you know, overuse of antibiotics, fertilizers, pesticides, all, you know, all the things external in the environment we do Aspirin. or internal that we take 
And then um, like breastfeeding or contact with vaginal births, you know, all those things, which are not unfortunately the norm. And I understand there's certain women for medical reasons can't do those, some of those things. I'm not arguing them. It just as the norm is like microbiome or the whole, the, the whole system is so important. And yet we do opposite of that. <laughs> and the bad part is that once you kill it off, it doesn't come back. So they've, they've tested, you know, uh, inoculating you, um, with other people's biome and trying to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, it does, it, it, some of it works, but, but not all of it. It's really, really hard to do, really expensive as well. And so when you're at us, you know, our generation, we, I don't know how many antibiotics you took, but I had ear infections all the time. They had me on course after course, after course, yeah. you know, um, every year, yeah. every year antibiotics. Yeah. And so yeah. for, so that like killed a bunch of my biome. Luckily, the kid's, kid's father was grown, you know, grown up with a hippie mom. My kid's father. Oh, cool. <laughs> Their biome's pretty good, but I really avoided okay. antibiotics as much as possible for my kids, you know, tried to do some home care. But yeah, it's once it's gone, it's gone. So I, I believe really that's one of the largest problems for mm -hmm. autoimmune disease right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just my theory, but mm -hmm. because we don't have that gut bacteria to combat so many different viral loads, pathogens, mm -hmm. our bodies become overwhelmed with inflammation and that's what's leading us to autoimmune. Yeah. So autoimmune actually, wasn't around uh, when we were kids. Rarely, 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 rarely. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't like, unfortunately it was, I think the nineties were a lot of women, especially women, like fibromyalgia was on the scene. Lupus was always around, but less numbers polymyositis was around but less numbers but fibromyalgia just seemed to like come from nowhere and I, if i remember correctly at first doctors pooed oh it's on your head and then they eventually oh, yeah. recognize it's not in your head it's actually a really physiological condition right but yeah 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 100 yeah. percent so 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 yeah we've we've done a uh now and now we can reverse we, and so we grow from here i i don't feel like it's you know a death sentence by any means <laughs> i feel that There'll be new pathogens that will grow in our gut, new things that will happen that will inoculate our gut to um, be able to cope with whatever our environment is now as humans. I mean, that's what we do, right? Well, I, I do know, having watched you train, you train outside and, and through seal fit, we train outside a lot in interesting environments. So you're getting a lot of mud and dirt and trees and pollen, you know, so like you do have the encounter with nature, which unfortunately a lot of kids do not. Like when we, we grew up, it's like, get out of the house, we'll see you for dinner. Cool. But like now it's like everyone's in the house playing video games. I would imagine not everyone, obviously, but you know, there's not, a, it seems like kids don't spend a lot of time outside getting dirty, playing, getting messy. So tell me about your, your kids food fight. Tell me all about that and what you guys do there. Well, I love that you brought that up about the kids being outside because when I when we look at childhood obesity, and let's just talk about a fact, a number right now, 2022 CDC number. So 20% uh, of children in America are obese, not pre-obese, not, right? I mean, they're there. So I, I God, what is that number? Let me see, I wrote it down for you because I thought it was such an important number. Um, 14 million. 14 million children, and that's just this country. And you have to remember, yeah. our economic fold is much higher than other third world countries. So obesity around the world, right? Um, and so obesity is built on sugar-sweetened beverages, right? It's built on um, screen time. Um, it's built on uh, socioeconomic factors. Parents aren't in the house. Parents can't cook meals. Parents are working. They're eating these foods. They're sitting yeah. inside. Yeah. And so that's those, that's like the trifecta right there of a problem. I mean, if you cross over into our culture, we all work too. You know, I work, right? So my kids, that extra effort has got to be made in order for us to properly fuel our kids or even ourselves. I think it'd be important for the listening of you and the audience to talk about why obesity is a problem. Like the why, why 14 million kids being obese is a problem. And because I will hear from some segment of society, oh, quit fat shaming. Okay, we can have that conversation. That's not the purpose of this conversation. This moment is more like, what are the consequences health-wise, short-term and long-term mm -hmm. of this childhood obesity epidemic? Mm 
Oh my goodness. I believe it's a 40% ratio of kids that are obese that grow up to be uh, obese adults as well. So, I mean, you know, that, that this is gonna trail into adulthood, you know, that, that chubby kid who thins out, that doesn't happen anymore, right? And that's not only because of the food, although the high fat and sugar loaded foods is a huge, huge top issue. You know, we're also talking about the biome, Michael, exactly what we were just talking about. We're talking about environmental factors, pesticides, um, yeah, the GMOs, right? All yeah. of these things. Yeah, and I would imagine too, like artificial lighting, the fact, the fact that kids and adults don't stick to the circadian rhythms of the day-night cycle, up later, sleep less, also a contributing factor, right? I'd, I'd imagine so. Yeah, I, I haven't even considered that, but 100%, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? Stress, yeah. right? What kind yeah. of stress are the kids being put under? You know, the parents aren't home or their parents are working too much or even in the United States, they're under tremendous stress for achievement nowadays yeah. yeah so so yeah i mean we have to look at all these factors and then the teens so the numbers are are pretty astonishing like 20 percent. i think it's like 14 percent of two to five year olds uh are obese and then 20 percent of six to 11 year olds and then 23 percent of 12 to 19 year olds so they just get more and more, more obese as the older that they get mm. it's not going the opposite direction so, yeah, I mean, it keeps trailing into adulthood and then this is going to lead to your diabetes. I mean, we know that one third of the world has is diabetic or pre-diabetic. Cardiovascular disease is even larger. The number is about half, 40% of the United, of the entire world, Michael, yeah. has CVD. Yeah. And I, I have to imagine there are cancer, certain percentages of certain types of cancers related to oh, you know, obesity as well. Mm -hmm. neurological disorders because you know tell me if you've heard this too that i've heard like for instance um uh, alzheimer's is in some quarters considered like a a um uh, um oh shit what, i just lost my train of thought it's considered a like um a downward path of obesity well no it's um Oh man, I can't believe I just lost my trip, my mind here. Um, <laughs> you can have, you can have, you can be diabetic. You can have two types. There's two types of diabetics, right? There's, yep. Um, what's the? There's one who type, are born. What's that? Type one and two. One, one is uh, it's born the failure with, right? of your pancreas to excrete okay. insulin. That's just a natural. That's a thing that happens. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, can happen any time in life, but it's okay. not so it's diet a, related. So it's a type, some people consider Alzheimer's a type three. That's why I couldn't remember. Interesting. I have diabetes. heard that. Yeah. Yeah. I have heard that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The research is pending. I mean, yeah. 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 Um, so Alzheimer's is, and I do know a lot of people that work in hospice care. Oh, really? And so yeah. just imagine being overweight and having, you know, no cognitive you know, reality, um, that's really hard for the workers as well. Really hard for them. Yeah, I could imagine, yeah, I could imagine. Mm -hmm. Trying to move an obese person. Uh, the expectancy, life expectancy of obesity is, is very, very shortened, you know, 50s, 60s. So you have to remember, uh, right? Oh yeah, and then also um, the, the other stuff that goes along with it, amputations. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever you see like a, a obese person that doesn't have a limb, that's diabetes, right? Because your yeah. circulation stops working in your extremities. That's what happens. I can imagine knee problems, back, like knee replacements, hip replacements, back issues as well, correct? Oh my goodness, yes. Yeah. But there's, you can't even do surgery on things like that, not in a state of obesity, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So the only two real things that help people lose weight out of an obese situation once you're you know past that threshold not as a child of course um but as an adult once your body's stabilized in that in that arena is um you know a lap, a, a lap band procedure okay yeah mm -hmm. and um just extreme extreme calorie restriction diets right that are uh, so stomach stapling lap bands things like that so yeah i mean it's incredibly difficult to lose weight once you pass that threshold of obesity so you guys are working with kids saying we don't want you to be adults who have these problems how do you work with kids 
what are the issues you work with? How do you work with them when they show up? So through the programs, we do a team generated healthy food focus. So this is the other thing, and I know that, that you'll connect with this, Michael, is that we don't want to shame anybody. We don't want kids to feel bad about food. We don't want to create another right mental disordered thinking around one food being bad and another not because these kids, you know, it's everywhere. And so if your bags of Doritos are everywhere, every corner of the earth, if I tell a kid that's bad, then his vision for other kids that are eating it, his vision for his self is uh, self-confidence when he eats that stuff is going to shrivel. So what the most important part for me is to empower kids with healthy food. What's that look like? And how do you do that? And so the program that we have is 28 days. It's simple. It's very small. And what really, honestly, every day they're supposed to eat a fruit or vegetable and they're supposed to document it, show it. We have days where they're eating green vegetables, days where they're eating um, a brand new fruit they never tried. Um, and because of food scarcity and socioeconomic uh, barriers for some kids, it's, we do can too. Right? So we're trying to reach every sector of the globe. Um, we do seasonal vegetables, things like that. So it's really up to the child to choose what that vegetable is with the parent. Because kids don't shop, Michael. And so a child that is obese is a direct result of a parent that is either un undereducated in, in, it, in, um, in nutrition, um, have less time, right? Um, and they also are people that eat unhealthily. That's how it goes. It's not in the house. Um, so what I'm hearing you say is that you, not only do you work with the kids, but you work with the family dynamic, whether it's a parent or parents from whoever the caregivers are. Right. Yeah. The parents first, right? The caregivers okay. first. And so I always want to give something away during one of these. And I know this isn't going to come as any surprise to anybody, but and it is it's the biggest obstacle for a parent helping his child to eat right. Whether you eat healthy or not. You cannot bring those foods into the home. You cannot bring those foods into the home. I'm going to repeat myself, okay? Um, you've got to figure out from very early on because these tyrants of children will gnaw at you until they get what they want. They're very persuasive. And so many folks fold under the pressure yeah. of their child, right? Having tantrums and fits and what we don't want to get there. We want to stop at a place where they've already tried healthy foods. They like them sort of, they don't. You figured out the, the uh, recipe sort of to, to get them to eat the carrots, to eat the green beans, right? And then every day you're feeding them fruits and vegetables every single day. And, and you don't bring the junk in the house. You don't bring the Doritos in the house. People, we've created a whole culture, all holidays around junk food and sweets and cakes. What's your birthday? Cake and pizza. Right, 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 right. It's you, your birthday. You're, you're celebrating your body. You're celebrating your, your life. life. <laughs> right? That, and that's very true. And Christmas and Thanksgiving and yeah, all, yeah, all this Candy stuff. Candy canes, yeah. right? Yeah. Chocolate yeah. hearts, chocolate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's Name it. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, it's funny because um, my folks, do you remember the Pritikin diet from like, he was, he was around in the late 70s, early 80s. Pritikin? Long time ago. Pritikin, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and my parents went to a workshop or conference, learned about the Pritikin diet, came home one day when I was like 9 or 10 or 11, completely got rid of all the good stuff. Well, good stuff. As a yeah. Kid. Um, like we had, like, like couldn't do peanut butter because it had the mold in it and like no sweets and no candies and no white bread, all gone, which is good. But like, it's kind of a shock, <laughs> like everything to nothing. <laughs> right. And, and, yeah. and kids, most kids will, you know, um, they, they'll, there'll be a mutiny. There'll be a mutiny in the household. <laughs> if that happens, some kids go on hunger, hunger strikes. I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're so used to those white foods, right? They taste so good. They create them in labs, Michael. They create these foods in labs so that they're irresistible. Yeah. Yeah. And children don't have the psychological development yeah. to right. understand or fight those those uh cravings 
So you're doing your child a complete disservice if you're giving them those foods early on. So now don't think my kids don't get that because they do, but I'll tell you when they get it outside of my home, okay. outside of my home or when grandma comes to visit because she always goes to Costco and comes back with these big packaged foods. I'm like, are you serious? Do you, ma, ma, oh, well you were fine and you ate it. I'm like, it's a different world, mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, kids weren't obese when I was a kid. There's other things, factors going on. And this is the one thing I can control from my kids, you know? So, um, you know, the good news is that my kids get, used to have a great palate for vegetables and fruits from early on, because I, I just knew this instinctively, like to, to give your kids, you know, um, blended peas and stuff as babies. So they could, you know, remember, I remember my daughter's face, like, <laughs> it's just like a weird taste, but now she loves it. It's just something that's ingrained. And then creating those, all these holidays, we really need to create healthy versions of some of the foods that we're using. If you never put marshmallows on your yams, your kids would never know. If you put butter and salt on your yams, right? And they never tried them with marshmallows, they wouldn't know any difference. So that's you. That's your, you know, my Midwestern background of meals, these high fat sauce meals, right? Like things don't need to be done that way. And, and we've got to make small changes so that when they celebrate food, they're actually celebrating good food, right? They're not celebrating, um, this is just going to be a big fat, you know, gorge fest meal that, uh, you know, um, that our culture supports. So, and not that Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving is typically a pretty healthy meal. There's a lot of vegetables and stuff, but. True. And turkey. Yeah. The stuff that surrounds it, the pies and, and, and you know, pies, pies are fine. You don't need five though. That's true. Don't need five. So you, so you do these challenges, you educate the kids, you educate the parents, educate the kids, yep. you encourage them to start modifying what they bring into the home. Um, I, I like to call it VA negativa, like what do you need to remove from your environment to support behavior change? Like a VA negativa, like what to remove? And then I hear via positiva, like what do you need to add to your environment? And it's like, oh, healthy foods, fruits and vegetables and remove the sugary stuff. So it's not available while they're at home. Cool. Because as you, you know, I'm sure you teach is like, willpower points are limited and if you're trying to fight from not eating something right in front of you all the day long it's easier because you don't have to think about it and you can use your willpower points for other things <laughs> absolutely yeah 100 yeah. percent. yeah this this challenge also sort of attacks each meal and and i don't and i don't want to cut off kids that are already eating you know unhealthily because this actually the challenge is for these kids it's from five to yeah. 13 that's okay. the focus group so what we do is we encourage them to make small shifts. So each week we attack a different meal. So the first week we attack breakfast and we say, how could you take the breakfast you're eating, cocoa puffs, right? And how can you make that a little bit healthier? What would that look like for you? Okay. So um, some children will just eat less and add fruit to it. Um, not to the cereal itself. That'd be gross with cocoa puffs in particular, but... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> have a banana with it or something. Um, we wanna encourage them to eat proteins in the morning. So the milk's important for some kids, you know, sometimes cereal is, is the best means for a parent. How can we shore that up? What about a raisin bran? What about something that's got some whole grains, you know, even a Cheerio, like Cheerio is one of the healthiest cereals you can give your kid. It's fortified, there's a lot of great stuff in there and there's the lowest amount of sugar compared to other, other cereals. So how do we make a better choice? And so we never like say, don't eat this, you know, and, and likewise with lunch and dinner and snacks, as we go down through the weeks of the, of the, of the challenge, we encourage them to be empowered by the folks. So the parents have basically two hours a week. They have to spend with their kids doing this challenge. It's simple. They have to take them shopping, nice, they take them nice. shopping for healthier, whatever the meal is choices for that week. Um, and the kids, we do encourage them to create a recipe of their own for that meal. Oh, cool. Right. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And then they shop for an, a strange fruit or vegetable they've never tried. Okay. I like right? it. We do experiments this yesterday. We just did a pickle experiment in our challenge, teach them how to make simple foods that are fun, that they like. Um, and, and then also, you know, consider what it would be like to take one food you're already eating and make a healthier choice of that, like the cereal. I like it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Good. And empower I, I them that, to make the choice at the supermarket. Yeah. So mom's there, but the kid's making the choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love that because you're encouraging them to have a choice, which is good, and then be creative within that choice. That's, and making it playful and fun. So it's not like, 
oh god it's more like oh cool i like that yeah yeah mom that spiky thing i want to eat that that's how they got this weird spiky <laughs> melon and they it was hilarious we all sat there kind of like hmm very weird but you know we tried it you know i i think it's in berkeley that some of the public schools or at least one of the public schools i remember reading this long a while back they actually have their own garden so the kids actually learn how to grow their own food and it's organic i'm sure because it's berkeley and like what how do you do this in the life and and ecological thinking and biology and all that kind of great stuff um do, do you find that other places too like do you ever run into kids who actually know where their food comes from knows how to grow their food or is it mostly kids like everything comes from the supermarket so statistically speaking, um, and this, this is really important, this is really important because this is also where this food challenge fits in, is that the kids who eat healthiest um, have education around, around nutrition. Okay. They, have, they know how to garden or they've gardened. Okay. And um, they taste, they do tasting challenges. Oh, nice. Okay. So these kids that are exposed to this environment, think about that gardening tasting yeah. and education yeah. that costs nothing that costs nothing we yeah. could do this for every kid in the world help yeah. them to understand right so when you garden you're invested right you take from a seed and you grow and then yeah. you eat it and it's right it's really yeah. exciting you get to see the progression um you, you know when they have education and they understand like what a macro is and they understand what protein is yeah why would they want to eat protein well, well, it makes your muscles stronger. It makes you grow taller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Healthier. You know, kids want to be taller. They want to be like their parents. So you have to use these keywords, right, to excite them. Um, and then tasting, you know, and they're not going to like everything, but it's fun. It's a challenge. So part of what we do as well is we dare. It's like a dare. It's like, I dare you to eat that, you know. Um, so it's, it's kind of fun. We just make, make it gamify it and make it fun like yeah. that. But those are the three factors that affect the nutritional value of a kid. There was a, a study of two th almost 3,000 kids out of Ontario, 2022. Um, and it said 40% of the kids in this study had um, below the recommended daily allowance of fruits and vegetables. Right, and this is because of food knowledge. Most of them, it was due to, um, it correlated to how much they knew about the foods they were eating. And the sad and the th thing that makes it even worse is like the daily recommended from the state or from the government. I don't know about the Canadian government. I, I know our USDA pyramid or plate, or I don't know what we call it these days. It's not very good anyways. So like what their, their minimum requirements from like, oh my God, that we should make it higher, but okay, we'll at least get the minimum. So the fact that so many percentages of kids are not even getting the minimum is even worse than you can imagine. It's it well. That's why we're in the situation we're in. Yeah, yeah. Right, because yeah. it's just fast and easy, and um, and they're brainwashed, literally brainwashed, by yeah. big companies, big corporations making Doritos. Right. Yeah. I mean, literally, that food makes them want to eat more. Yeah. So we got we've got to work in the opposite direction, and and that's just by shoring up the healthy stuff. And parents have to do it first. But you know. Um, question for you like you know you am we talk about boo background of obviousness and you just talk about big corporations and yes they make their products addictive intentionally so you want more and more and more and more but also the marketing mm. and like and like you know I, I don't know about you but the the when i do fasting i don't mean intermittent fasting but like i do fasting for multiple days all of a sudden you're like oh my god how many commercials are in tv or on the sides of the bus or in the magazines like they're everywhere you know, look talking about brainwashing. How do you help parents work through that if their kids are, and even the parents are always going to see these commercials or billboards or, you know, they're in line at the grocery store and all the crap is right there? I know. <laughs> and, and so that's a great question. As far as the grocery store, because they're going to want to go down the cereal aisle, right? They're going to want to go down the inner aisles. That's where all the fun stuff is. That's where all the yeah. brightly colored things are. Um, and so, for my children, I have them pick out, you know, one thing that they want every time I take them shopping and I don't take them shopping often. So if they want to go and help me be of service, you help mom out do some shopping. Great. Then you get to pick one thing, one food. 
oftentimes my kids pick like salmon now they'll go and get smoked salmon oh that's cool I yeah mean, yeah they awesome love it too. you know it's nice. one of those things that you know i don't always buy um but they, they will go and get you know i mean if you looked over here i've got some wheat cheerios and i uh, uh, it looks like there was some um like healthy version cocoa puff things that they they like they got those um, but they, the thing is, is they go so fast, Michael. <laughs> they like don't last a day. <laughs> they don't last a day because your, they're your, little... your kids are teenagers, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, come on. <laughs> yeah. They eat everything. But, but even back when they were little, you know, I would let them get like, you know, one thing of cereal and they'd be gone in two days. They'd each have two bowls and they'd be gone. And then it just doesn't come around again for a while. Mm, okay. You know? um, so they don't go shopping for a while. So now they're going to get what I'm buying. And, um, and it just kind of works out that way. And then they start to, you remember, you have to remember like um, their stomach aches and things when kids eat too much candy, too much soda, there's physiological mm -hmm. response, even if they don't uh, um, have like the brain fog and some of the debilitating scenarios that we get yeah. as adults with bad food, like we can tell right away. Yeah. Kids' metabolisms are crazy. Like they can, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of kids eat really bad food and they're still really thin as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you, and that's a great point too, Michael, that just made me think. If you think about all the kids that are obese, that 20% of American kids, I would wager that 70% of American kids still aren't obese, but are still eating. Um, a higher way, much higher recommendation of these sugar sweetened processed foods. Uh, is that called fat skinny? So they, they look skinny. skinny, but they actually, yeah, okay, yeah. Right. Yeah. So they, they, not they even so that. Have... Child, they don't really get fat skinny. They're just kind of, you know, little people that have, um, you know, pre, pre diabetic. <laughs> They're just. Yeah, I was going to say like metabolic disorders as a result of their eating. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And they don't even get that, but they do get spikes. So oftentimes a parent mm. can tell, you know, give your kid a banana and see what happens. And then watch them 20 mm. minutes later and see what happens. Because that's about how long it takes that banana sugar to process, maybe 45 minutes in the gut. Mm. And then they crash. And then they're going to be looking for another sugar. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Even though a banana is healthy. Yeah. It strikes me. I've so I have a question, not specific for kids, because I understand with what you're sharing. It's like you, you got to work with kids where they're at, the environments they're in, their socioeconomic conditions, their educational condition, all that, and the family dynamic. But so, but I have two questions. More like, let's step out of that and just talk more broadly about nutrition. Um, do you ever do you ever have clients use like a glucose monitor so they can actually see firsthand, or do you know people who use glucose monitors not because they have, they're diabetic, they're actually healthy. They want to see the effects of various foods on their system. Uh, oh yeah, uh, athletes love to do that nowadays. I yeah. see people yeah, yeah. with those things yeah, yeah. on all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. My it, opinion it's, is it's a bit much unless you're a professional athlete. I think okay. that you know physiologically, you can look on the package and understand what a food's going to mm -hmm. do to you. Um, if you feel like you have regulatory issues. Um, sure. Or if you want to just sample and do a little, you know, test yourself for a yes. few months. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's it's interesting information. I, I don't necessarily yeah. recommend it. Even people who are most of the people I work with um, right now are maybe 20, maybe 40 pounds oh. overweight, some a little mm -hmm. heavier. But mm -hmm. for the most part, they know what they're supposed to be eating. So it's just another reinforcement that, oh, yeah, I had that coffee cake. Look at my blood sugar. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And so it's that, and we talk about this all the time in Beatable, right? It's like, where's the pain point? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's the same with the kids and the diabetes. That's why um, it's such an epidemic, in my opinion. There's just no pain point for the parents. The kids aren't actually sick, like we get sick. Mm -hmm. Right? And so the parents, like, well, you know, Joey's chubby. <laughs> okay. Right? Yeah. And so parents go out of it. Yeah, in some cultures, 100% proud of it. In some cultures, like a chubby kid's a great thing, you know, it means it's a sign of wealth. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true, very true. Yeah, 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 yeah. But my, so cool, thank you on the on the, the glucose monitor because I find like a lot of the people I work with who are biohackers or athletes, yeah, they love that stuff. More information, the better. Um, yeah. But what's what's interesting about them who use it is they find out the bioindividuality of their system. Like they are unique compared to other people. Yeah, generally speaking, certain ca category of food will have an effect on everyone, but the effect will be slightly different based on the who the person is. 
But <clears throat> I have a question for you. You mentioned grains. I'm like, oh, I'm going to channel Rob Wolf. <laughs> Yeah. What are your what what are your thoughts? And not not specific to Rob, but I'm just kind of teasing on that one. But like there's so many diets out there. And this is not for the kids, just as like the adults you work with, paleo and primal and and keto and vegetarian and vegan and God knows what else is out there. Like, you know, how do you help people maneuver through the fads and then where the diet systems that are out there? That's a fantastic question. So the first thing I do, Michael, is and this is functional medicine 101. I take everyone through elimination diet, my six weeks to clean okay. their eating. And so I eliminate foods and see how they function better without those foods. Not a caloric deficit necessarily, but sometimes mm -hmm. it, it looks like that eventually. Um, and so then I want to find out how their body reacts to foods. And then from that knowledge, even vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. like fodder, oh, yeah. like beans, cauliflower, they destroy my gut. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I do really well on wheat. And so that's really specific to me. Of course, I eat organic and all that and whole grains, you know, like I'm really particular about the kind of uh, wheat that I eat, but it's just really, it's really specific. And that's why, you know, a nutritionist is great. Um, you can do it yourself. You eliminate, you know, all your dairies, you eliminate your grains, you eliminate sugars, right? Um, and then sugars, when we look at sugars, a lot of people actually have uh, fructose intolerance. So too much fruit can upset the gut as well. So there's so many different things. And this is a result of that biome conversation we started off having in the first yeah, yeah, place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Square one. What has happened to your bio and why are you in the situation you are now? What foods upset you? So it's just taking a closer look at, um, you know, your genetics, first of all, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, your epigenetics, yep. how you've evolved into this space. And, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I don't know what you like and what you don't like. So I guess the answer to that is I work individually. I, try, I tend not to do keto unless someone's severely overweight. Mm. Um, I just believe in that sugar. I believe in fruit and vegetable. I think the fiber mm. content of fruit and vegetables are really important. And I know you can get away with um, doing a ketogenic diet without that. But um, as, a train, as, as a fitness person um, and kids, for sure, I don't believe they should be on a ketogenic diet. They burn off sugar like this, right? Um, that's half the problem. Oh, also, I think for some females, it can be problematic premenopausal in terms of like affecting their menses too, which is something you got to be careful of. That's, I believe that's from, um, that's from fat, the fat body fat reduction is why they get that, Michael. Mm. Oh, really? Yeah, because they get so lean that the mince stops, right? Okay. And so, so it's not yeah. keto specific. It's mm, not the I don't hype. think so. Okay, interesting. I, okay. I, I don't know that for sure, but I'd be yeah. curious to find that out. Stand, I stand corrected through. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, so yeah, that, that'll go away from, you know, uh, a really low calorie diet. So you have to remember like most ketogenic diets are low calorie. So people lose weight. Hmm. What, what are your, what are your thoughts? So I, I, I love the bioindividuality. Let's see what works for you. Look at genetics, epigenetics, let's to food test. What do you think about like, intermittent fasting or fasting in general? Is that part of the work you do do? I do. And I love fasting. It's my superpower. I feel like even as a woman, you know, and I'm of the age of menopause as well. And so, um, my, you are? my yeah, yeah. I'm 50 baby. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I, I, as far as like cognitive function and energy production, man, I utilize sugar or anything I put in my body so much better after and only just so you know, a 12 hour fast. So I go from about six, okay. no, maybe it's about 14, 15 14. hours. So six, seven at night. And lately it's been eight because we later eight to uh, 10 or 11. I never, you know, and I do. Uh, and so there's research, there's back and forth around if you can be fasting with a, like a 200 calorie coffee drink in the morning, you know, a little bit of cream and your coffee a little bulletproof coffee <laughs> a little dave asprey work <laughs> right some people say that you're still in a fasted state um uh the autoph uh, autophagy, autophagy doesn't yeah. the autophagy doesn't um, shuts off when you have any calories so if you're in it for that then you have to be in a completely fasted state actually funny enough i just learned that couple of days ago, I was talking to a doctor friend of mine and I'm like, oh, I use scav I don't do bulletproof coffee anymore because my genetics, I did testing and I don't process saturated fat very well. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, I need to reduce that. Mm -hmm. But I, I had stevia 
And he's like, even stevia stops that. I'm like, oh shit. Okay. Black, black, black coffee. <laughs> black coffee, right? Um, and the autophagy is really important because that's why that is why I feel my biggest benefit from fasting is. Right. Because um I'm getting rid of all of the, the negative cells in my body. It's they're getting yeah, yeah, eaten yeah. up. They're getting eaten up. Um, yep, they're getting eaten up really. Um, used for food. And then I, I also believe between meal, semi-fasted state, right? So I do big intervals between my meals. Oh. Mm -hmm. I'll do a little snack midday, probably less than 200 calories, a piece of fruit or a handful, a couple okay. of nuts or something. Um, but I really only have two major meals a day. So like a, a lunch and a dinner? Yeah, it's kind of a lunch yeah. breakfast. Yeah, lunch okay. breakfast and then like a dinner lunch. I okay, try to get cool. that in. Yeah, I try to get that in, you know, um, later. They're both pretty later in those in those zones. But I like to eat breakfast foods, so. <laughs> you do? Yeah, yeah, I like avo toast and um, eggs. Yep. Yeah. But eggs also, for some people, that's one of those foods that people will keep in their diet and they can uh, really wreak havoc, especially people. I've got the same thing with the saturated fat. Mm. I did a genetic test. It wasn't, it was, oh gosh. Oh no, I have to think of it. Oh, it's the one that's that that all the functional medicine doctors do right now. Hmm. I can't remember it. Anyway, it told me that my saturated fat and my um, choline intakes were way high, which is what you get from your egg, and that my um, gallbladder was overproducing bile. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it told me to take eggs out, you know, more. Not I was eating like every day, and I eat them a couple times a week. Wow, God, that sucks. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. I kind of love them. Like, you know, they're yeah. a big deal for me. I would eat them every day. I was eating them every day. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It is so yeah. individual. These these tests are fantastic to help you understand too. I wish I could remember the name of that. I'll post it for you later. Um, yeah, yeah please, do, please. Do. Yeah, it's a great one. And it tells you so much about your own biome. It, it also told me some things about apples. There's some like viral load you get from apples early on that, you know, kind of sticks around your biome and you should be, you know, wow. all kinds of, yeah, really cool stuff in this test. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Definitely send it to me because I'm probably very interested. And it tells you, you, you your, can't um, see. Go ahead. it tells you biological, biological age too. Um, I mean, your, uh, your physical age as uh, opposed to your biological age. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Funny. I was pointing over there. You can't see, but I have like five tests lined up that I have to go pee into and send off. And a lot of them are those kind of tests, including um, the, bio the biological test, biological age versus my um, regular real age, Chron chronological age, different than the biological age. So I'm curious, yes. like, Ooh, am I younger than I think I am or am I older than I actually am? <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, it told me all these things. And then it told me my, <laughs> my um, biological age was 32. Wow. Right. Good so, job. Yeah. So that was cool. So then all the other stuff they told me, I'm like, eh, whatever. Like, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a terrible way to be. It. Um, no, I do cut out some eggs, though, because I, I'd like to feel like I do feel like I'm in my 20s. I feel so young. I feel um, so energetic, way more so than any period of my life. Oh, good. good. Yeah. Um, I repair well. And this, I think, also comes with age, Michael. I think it comes with knowing what kind of fitness is right for you. Actually, you just you just read my mind because I was like, oh, I want to talk about what you do with clients. And I was going to reference you. like, Because, like, you know, I know you, you were a CrossFitter. You're a SEAL fitter. When I saw you, you're a surfer. At least when you were surfing last time I saw you. Oh, yeah. um, you know, what, what's your training regime look like these days? And then how do you work with your clients? Not the kids, but like mm -hmm. adults that you work with on the, in the fitness space. Well, I'll tell you, you know, I work with a lot of people of my own age mm -hmm. and it's really, really important for me to keep that, um, you know, over 180 heart rate, you know, extended heart rate level down for people of, of this age, particularly, uh, peri and menopausal women. Mm -hmm. Um, that sweet spot's about 120, 140 for somebody um, in that in that arena, and so we want to look at like 30 to 40 minutes a day of you know elevated heart rate, modest heart rate, and exercise. And that can be anything. It can be weightlifting. It can be running. It can be Peloton. 
Um, I do want to spike that heart rate a few times a week, you know, momentarily, maybe five minutes at a time, and get it, crawl it up there, right? Yeah, yeah, sprint yeah. work, all that good stuff, you know, CrossFit workout. That's maybe 15 minutes where I'm really going hard, maybe twice a week. And that's really what I stick to. My inflammatory markers have gone down. I'm way less inflamed. I'm way more mobile. I repair mm. better. So um, when we're really heavy training, and, and so you have to think of like the younger people, and I wouldn't advise a younger person the same. Um, it's really important to build up those engines and you're in your mm. 30s and your 20s. So that when you get to this age, right, it's spinning that flywheel and maintaining and continuing to um, increase muscle mass, which is what we want to do at this age, is an easier game. So, you know, it, you know, you can always start now and work on it, but you're going to bust your ass and that will mm -hmm. affect you cognitively. Mm -hmm. It'll affect your health in general when you train really hard, still yeah. fit hard, right? Unless you want to be a SEAL. Um, and I'm not talking about a couple times a week, but every day, you know, you know, cause you did a SEAL, you did the Kokoro as well. Yeah. Yeah. And the soft Academy and all that kind of good stuff. It crushes yeah. you, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. And you have to like yeah. literally repair from that. Yeah. An, an interesting question I always ask my clients is, is this, is what you do training wise for performance or longevity? Because of performance, like I'm training up for a Spartan race, Kokoro, or that's a different mindset and right. a different set of training and different need to recovery. And it's a short term thing. I mean, it could be for months and months and months for an end of the year thing, which is different from, and I think you would agree, like then longevity training. Like I want to train so I can live a life, a long life, a long life of quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And so really you have to focus on what it is you love. And so if most people who don't exercise, they never exercised. So that's the biggest barrier with my clients is like, no, nah, I, I never did. I never swam. I never did anything. So now I've got to find a sweet spot of what it is that you enjoy to do. So dancing, like what would you yeah. do every day? Um, and so then from that area, um, we focus in on what that training program is going to look like. But typically, right, it's um, moderate physical exercise almost every day, if they can, uh, 30 to 45 minutes. And it just depends on the person, what they're into. What do you think of weight training in general? Because I heard you mention like, you know, weight training and Peloton and running and sprints. But like, you know, some of the research I've been reading in terms of weight training, it's not saying don't do these other things, but weight training is really important, not just to build muscles, but muscles don't burn fat or you have them, the more fat you burn. But in terms of menopause and, mm -hmm. and bone health, mm -hmm. you know, do you, do, you, do you recommend for older women or for mm -hmm. young women, but older women who are like premenopausal, menopausal, to start doing weight training to benefit their, their bones. I do, but I also think body weight exercises are just as useful. Remember, cool. okay. if you're doing a push up, you're pushing you know, half your body weight, roughly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's a strength training move, right? If you're yeah. squatting, you're squatting half of your body. So people can start with just simple body weight nice. movements yeah. Yeah. and then grow from there. You know, we always forget about those things and they're so effective. The soft training in itself is body weight, right? These kids, oh, yeah. Yeah. you know? And so, yeah. Um, yeah, but but strength training is fun and weights are fun. Gives you something to focus on. It can ground yeah. people with weight if they're squatting, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So uh, whatever's fun, whatever is fun for that person, they can stick to. If they don't have, you know, equipment at their house, but you want to get them on something a few times a week, yeah, put them on a, put them on a body weight. I like it. That's cool. Yeah. You know, how, how do you how do you work with a client whose partner is not into or in opposition to the intent of your client? Like, oh, I want to start physically training. I want to eat better. I want to sleep better. I want to deal with my stress better. You know, whatever you're working with your client on, and their partner's like, ooh, wait, I don't want to change what we're doing. I don't want to do differently. I don't want you to be out there exercising. What's how do you, how do you deal with that? If that's, that's the grand sabotage, right? That's the grand yeah. saboteur. That's, that's exactly what, what happens um, with kids. Mm. And it breaks my heart yeah. because that's, they're holding their partner back from help. Yep. Yep. And it's only out of their own fear. Um, it's very difficult. You know, it's very difficult to, to, to work with that. Um, oftentimes I'll ask the partner to come on a call. And this does work. And um, I say, are you willing to support, you know, Jen with this 
program that she's on. You know, her doctor said she's got cardiovascular disease. She's pre-diabetic. We need to help her, be right? And they definitely, the guy is in the same boat, mostly, or the girl. The partner. Yeah, yeah. They're in yeah. the same boat. And they're like, yeah, you know, I could use some help too. And so I'm like, great, that'd be even the best if you could buddy up. Typically they'll, they'll, if they're, if they're asked just to help, they'll recognize that they need to do it as well. Um, there's gotta be a pain point. Unfortunately, yeah. But like I, I tell you, one of even my best friends, her husband's, you know, like not healthy and it's so hard for her. It's so hard for the whole dynamic. Um, genetically, he's not you know, uh, he's got, there's tons of obesity in his family. They're just kind of built that way, big people. So it's difficult. Um, and I think you just have to approach it with each individual person, you know, um, mm -hmm. hopefully they support and hopefully you can get them in a few rules, runway rules, you know, um, and that's, that's also with kids, you know, like don't have it in the house. Um, during the holidays, you know, you can have five pieces or, you know, there's rules, around yeah. some of the food that you know you create for everyone in the house yes i'm an adult if i want to go have an almond joy you know what i'm not going to buy a bag and i'm gonna i'm not going to bring it in front of my little ones right why would i do yeah. that to them like why yeah, do you yeah, want yeah, to do yeah. that to your kid yeah same thing with okay. this kind of a scenario you know yeah makes sense uh, yeah but i know tons of people who are vegan and their spouse eats meat like you know i mean it's unfortunate that, you know, we can't all pair up and have be that, you know, the same on the same diet, but it's, it's just a fact. It just happens. Um, sometimes, just in California. Yeah. Right. <laughs> sometimes that why for, for somebody to quit losing the weight is because, you know, they want to be there for their kids. And hopefully, you know, when oh, I work no. with someone yeah. whose partner's not on board, their why starts with, I want to be there for my kids or, um, I want to feel better about myself, but then eventually part of their why becomes helping their partner. Good. I want to be an example. You know, this is, this is what of all of our religions are built on. Being right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. So if they can connect to a higher power as well, that can help. Right. Yeah. Good. No, that's, that's wonderful. Cause it's a uphill battle. If like you said, the partners not only not supportive, but on counter to support, like they're actively pushing against you. So I appreciate your approach to that. Um, and I would imagine part of that too is like compassion. Yeah. Because like, yes. you know, it's hard to break our patterns, our habits, our ways of doing things, especially if they're supported by the culture at large. Everything yeah. supports it. Yeah. yeah. It's such an uphill battle. Yeah. There's also that window. You know, I tell people you have that one week window. And we have to remember, Michael, that when people start to lose excessive weight, they toxify their body. So this is one of the tips that I give people. I'm like, you're not gonna feel good for a few weeks because you're gonna have all the fats gonna release all these toxins that have been stored in your body for years into your blood. So what we need to do is you need to up your vegetable intake. You need to pee a lot, right? You need to sweat, pee and poop <laughs> as much as you can. So typically on that first week of a diet where someone needs to lose over 20 pounds, I'll put them on a high dosage of vitamin C Oh. Yeah, and magnesium because that's going to keep their digestive oh, yeah. function right moving. Mm -hmm. So we're flushing, we're flushing. Um, I'm going to get them on a high electrolyte base, mm -hmm. right? Because they're going to want that anyway. They're going to want like some salt and they're going to crave stuff. So that's going to help. Um, and then, yeah, they got to move. They got to move a couple times, you know, if they can as much as possible, get the dog out, whatever it looks like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that those three things will help them actually feel better because it's going to increase serotonin and dopamine, right? Um, going to create those happy, um, yep. neurotransmitters. And then it's also going to, uh, rinse them out and get them well faster. So cool. it's not just stop. It's not just reducing caloric intake. There's so mm -hmm. much to it. Yeah. 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 And you, you kind of mentioned about disordered eating earlier, you know, I, I, and I, and I just ask you to kind of break that down a little bit more because I could imagine not you, but it, you have to, it, people in the nutrition, dietitian, kind of coaching space, you'd be careful because, you know, it, it can perhaps help people lead towards eating disorders mm -hmm. if they're not careful of how they approach it. And it sounds like, you know, what your approach is like contrary to that, you're the exact opposite, not to make people feel bad for their choices. 
is to educate them so they can make better choices and then support those new choices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not make like, well, that's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good. That's good. Yeah. (coughs) All right. It's just too much out there. And then hopefully most, some people can't, you, you quit drinking. If you're an addict, you quit smoking. If you're an addict, you quit drugs. If you're an addict, you can't quit food. No, no. So some people will have to completely eliminate certain foods from their diet and never, and, and look the other way when it's around them. Like it is going to have to be mental for some people. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some people will have to have their stomach stapled. They will have to do, you know, drastic measures in order to lose Mm -hmm. the weight. This is just a fact. It's just how it is. Um, So how do we support that person best? And you know what I mean? Like we're humans. Um, And we need to be seen and heard. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And, and I could imagine it could be interesting because some people eat food for emotional or stress related reasons. And you know, as a therapist, I've encountered people who like to keep the weight on, not, not consciously, like consciously, like I'm going to lose weight. Unconsciously, like I need to keep the weight on because it's a protective mechanism. It's a way yeah. when I eat the way I do, it keeps me from feeling what I feel. And the weight protects me from some something or someone out there. Mm-hmm. It's like a whole other dynamic beyond just calories in calories out yeah there's so much of that women have a huge ordeal with that i have a lot of clients like that what i'd like to uh one of the ways i approach that michael is that you know um we're not all meant to be 135 pounds i i like to ask women when was the last time you weighed what you want to weigh again and they're like when i was 25 i'm like all right Um, when, so when's the last time you weighed that when I was 25, okay, you're 50. Um, so we need to shift your mindset around what it is to be healthy for you. Um, what it means to have cognitive function, what it means to achieve your goals, because this stuff all goes together. People stop having motivation for life when they're overweight, they look in the mirror, they don't like what they see. They don't like themselves. They blame themselves for being weak minded you try things doesn't work that perpetuates that negative cycle of thought and that negative self-perception right and then they come to me and they're like how do i do this can you help me do you have a secret pill and i say yeah first of all love yourself like let's look at um what it would be for you to lose 20 pounds 20 pounds i'm gonna be a size six when were you size six when i was 25 (laughs) How much motivation do you have to do that? Do you have, you know, four hours a day to go train still? No, I have an hour. Okay, so what if we lost 10 pounds? We got you back into a size eight or a 10. Yeah, I think I'd feel really good. Yeah, great, great. Well, let's just, you know, let's just work to that and let's be realistic. Um, and, and then, right. I mean, I'm, a, and so you have to remember, right? I've been training, like I train for 20 some years. And I never stop. It is actually my job to be fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, That's what I tell people. (laughs) It's my job to be fit as I am. And there's people much more fit than me too, by the way, way more fit. Because I like to have a balance as well, right? I feel like it it makes me um, just a happier human to eat cake sometimes. You know, I control it and it is what it is. But, you know, I just follow my own rules. Don't have it in the house. Um, so I, I do want you to walk through, okay, how do people find kids food fight? How do people find you in functional medicine, nutrition space? How do people find you as a seal fit UM coach? Uh, but before we get there, um, actually we'll, we'll go there and then I'll ask my final question to you. So kids food fight, who, who, who is it only for people in Southern California or can oh, it's a worldwide, is it virtual? It's okay. Yeah, virtual. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So where? kidsfoodfight.com and you can follow us on instagram or facebook as well and we start our next challenge on january 15th 28 days new year challenge it's so simple um we have a mighty networks platform for social oh fun right so it's private and some people want to keep that you know they're especially with kids we want to keep their their information private and group 
So we start new groups like that and then the kids will come on and they'll post their recipes and there's, um, you know, all kinds of great stuff to go along that I've already described for you. So yeah, they'll just go to Kids Food Fight and they can register there, kidsfoodfight.com. And then okay. we'll start then. And in the meantime, you'll get some cool, you know, tips and tricks and stuff to help get your kids ready for it, you know. And, right, right, right. Right. Um, so there's some free stuff there for everybody. Uh, medmel.com. Okay. Med and that's Mel. for your functional medicine slash nutrition work okay that's right that's for functional medicine and nutrition you can visit that site I'm happy to work with you virtual and, and in person yes okay good right cool. um and i do i train people too which you have to be in socal you know i have private okay. training clients and we do kind of all the work together unbeatable you can find me through medmel with unbeatable as well if you want to do you know that five mountain whole life training it really goes together with the nutrition and everything. Most people come to mm -hmm. me for nutrition and then they're like, oh, I have this boo. Oh, <laughs> let's, let's timeline, right? That's part of functional medicine. They all go together so well, Michael, right? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, if yeah. I take a timeline, functional medicine, we timeline folks. We take them from the beginning and we say, we, you know, what was your birth? Was it vaginal birth? Great. Um, mm -hmm. Did you have antibiotics? Okay. Um, when did your parents divorce? Here, trauma. So we, we kind map of out. yeah map it all out what are illnesses you had leg breaks whatever so i got a full picture i do the same with unbeatable with trauma mm -hmm. this happened here my dog died here you know whatever these big things were and then i overlay them and then i go oh okay okay now we can see a pattern this is where you gained weight okay um, you had a virus here oh this could have led to this yeah. right yeah, yeah, yeah. so many different factors that's what regular farm, you know, doctors don't do. They don't have time to. Unfortunately not. No, no that's right. good. Yeah. Right. It's a much more extensive look. So, um, yeah, I love that. That's good. Okay, cool. So that's the kids work. That's the med mal work or med slash nutrition work, functional medicine slash nutrition work. You as an unbeatable mind. So for coach, so my last question for you is tell me about Kokoro 29. What were your like takeaways? What did you learn about yourself? Um, I was always pretty fearless in my life. I, I'll do stuff. Um, I'll, I will do things. I'll try things. And if it fails, I'm okay with that. But what Kokoro 29 taught me moving forward is team. Mm. I've kind of been my own solo human for a long time. Made my way out to California on my own. All these things mm. on my own. Um, it's during that event, I learned that I could not do that without my team. There's no way. And not only was it impossible, but it was so joyous. It's so much more rewarding to do anything in this life with a team of people and to share yeah. the victory, of the awesome. success or bear the burden of the failure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I look at my timeline and I look at, um, how I worked my way out of really bad situations, my down, my downturns in life. Mm -hmm. There was always somebody or a team there. Wow. Okay. Good. Yeah. And that became really clear during Kokoro. So ever since then, um, I've just had the best mentor. I've looked for mentors. I've looked for great teammates, and together, we're just trying together, trying to change the world. You know, one kid, one right. person at a time. I love that. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I love that, and. Uh, I will say you're also a badass because I, as I mentioned earlier, I was actually there at your cook row and I got to watch you and coach you through some stuff in a fun way. Um, and uh, like to see you in the ice baths and just kicking ass and then all the other things too. I was like, yeah, you're a great teammate, but you're also just a badass on your own. So <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> well, I only did it for the other people. Remember? Cause they were like, if you don't stay in that ice bath, then we're going to continue tor torturing, you know, Danielle over there. And I'm like, oh, poor Danielle. I'm coming, Danielle. I'm going back in the ice bath. It's always eyes off ourselves, right? Eyes on someone else. Yeah. And so that's, that, that was my biggest takeaway. And then, you know, I've got a pretty strong spirituality. I have through life. I've turned away from it um, for a long time. And that's the other thing that I learned that um, all of this is really, um, you know, I'm just a vessel for whatever I make myself, whatever positive change I make myself available to, right? 
I don't really even feel responsible for this leg of work I'm doing. I feel like I've just been called to do it and it's my duty for good or bad, you know? I mean, what I mean by that is it's a lot of work starting a corporation, right? It's a lot of work taking on this responsibility and financial obligations and things. So um, if there's, there's just no question in my mind that it has to be done. So that determination comes out of Kokoro as well. Um, I don't think I've ever quit anything <laughs> ever since Kokoro. There's no quit in me at all. So if I set my mind to it, I'll do it. You, you'll probably, you'll, I know you'll find this funny, like when I finished Soft Academy in, in Kokoro, uh, anytime I complain about anything for the first couple of years, Jen would be like, I'm going to call Mark and tell me you're complaining. <laughs> I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> that too, suffer in <laughs> silence. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I catch myself no. if I make noise during workouts. I'm like, sure. Oh, sure. that's right. <laughs> and no hands on your side? <laughs> no hands on the side, ever. Yeah. I think about Chris all the time when I put my hands on my side. <laughs> oh my God, isn't that funny? It never goes away. I mean, it seems like yeah. yesterday still. Yeah. Well, Mel, it's been great to catch up with you. I appreciate your time and hearing all that you're up, up to and uh, wish you much luck on all these fun adventures you're on thank you michael thank you yeah. i appreciate you i appreciate your work and you supporting me and everyone that you support by doing what you do thanks mel yeah there's nothing in between you and me nothing in between blue and sea nothing in between us and love